what you love about New York City. Well, where do I begin? So um, I'm born and raised in New York City, in Brooklyn specifically. Um, and I've, it's a place where I need to be. I worked in New York City. I was with the police department for 34 years. And uh, New York is, is unique, I guess, as many other cities are across the country, but it's unique within itself. Uh, it's a series of neighborhoods in New York City. And each has its own ethnic diversity and backgrounds and cultures and all of that. And uh, being a police officer in this backdrop, in this environment, um, you've learned so much, I've, I have at least, learned so much about uh, human dynamics. What was it like growing up in Brooklyn? Yo, Brooklyn. Brooklyn was great. Um, again, the same thing. Um, I come from an uh, uh, Italian-American background, so I grew up mostly in an Italian neighborhood with all the cultures that come from, from that culture, Italy, the foods, uh, the, the passion, all of that. So it was a great time growing up. What drew you to public safety? Well, I tell you, you know, what, what drew me to public safety was um, out of high school, I needed a job. I was looking for a job. So I taught, started taking all the civil service exams. Fire department, police department, sanitation department, bus driver. Uh, I worked as a, as a truck driver uh, for a plumbing supply store. And I delivered uh, plumbing supplies, not only in Brooklyn, but also throughout the city. And then uh, finally, uh, I started getting some calls. The first call I got uh, from a city agency was the, for the bus driver after taking all these other tests. And I started processing for the bus driver position. And then I got a letter from the police department saying that I had passed the entrance exam and I'd be interested you know, to call this phone number and make an appointment and come in. So I said, oh, okay. Uh, I knew I always respected police officers growing up. I never thought about baby being one, but you know, now the opportunity might present itself. So I called the number and then uh, I processed for that, and, and the rest uh, is history, as they say. And I became a police officer back in 1982. 82. So if you wouldn't mind, kind of walk me 82 through your career. What are some of the jobs that you had within the department? Sure. Well, I started out after the police academy. I was assigned to a, uh, a field training unit. We worked with a uh, uniformed, uh, well-experienced veteran, detective. and. Uh, and you learn kind of the inner dynamics of being a police officer. You're on probation for 18 months, by the way. So if you, uh, if you mess up at any one time, big time, they'll just fire you. You know, there's no civil service protection with that within those 18 months. So I started working with the uniformed detective and also you know, on your own on foot post and things like that. And, and after that, that was about a year, I was assigned then to uh, one of the Brooklyn precincts, 72nd Precinct. Uh, it's in the Sunset Park section of Brooklyn, which is a largely Hispanic community. And I uh, actually uh, worked there for many years, over three different ranks at different times, as a police officer, as a sergeant, and as a lieutenant, which was my final rank. So uh, I worked uh, in the precinct, doing, answering 911 calls, calls for assistance, calls for service. And um, I did well as a police officer there. I uh, had a very pretty good reputation. I did my job. And I was then, uh, there was a brand new unit starting called the Community Policing Unit. It was a, in fact, there was a pilot program in that particular precinct, the 72nd Precinct. And I'm talking now uh, probably June of 1982. I think that's when it started. And there was nine, nine police officers that were selected to fill these nine different patrol posts. They were foot posts. And I was asked if I'd be willing to do it. So it was a big honor that I was selected to do this, you know, based on my past activity and everything I was doing, you know. So I did it, and um, I did that for just uh, maybe under a year. And uh, then a position opened up in the anti-crime unit, which is a plain clothes unit in, within the precinct. And uh, I was offered that position. So I took that as a patrol officer. Been on several jobs during my time in the, in the precinct with the emergency service unit, mostly disturbed individuals or hostage situations and things like that. And I was always very impressed with the way the emergency service unit had conducted themselves. So I think I'd like to be like one of those guys. 
<clears throat> so I, uh, I, I uh, submitted an application, interviewed, and I was accepted into emergency service. And that was, I think, um, January of 1986 when that happened. Can you give me what your definition of emergency services is? Because I don't think a lot of folks truly understand all the roles and responsibilities that roll up under ESU. Yeah. The emergency service unit in the New York City Police Department is, is probably unique, as opposed to other, many other jurisdictions, police jurisdictions across the country. Uh, so it's the tactical branch or the tactical arm of the New York City Police Department. So most people across the country would know that as SWAT, SWAT standing for Special Weapons and Tactics. So the emergency service unit in New York City is that, except it's also a high-risk rescue unit. So, for example, uh, you know, if someone climbs to the top of the Brooklyn Bridge here in New York City uh, contemplating suicide, the emergency service unit would be tasked to climb up the girder of that bridge to try to talk to that individual and try to save him from himself. It's also um, a, a multifaceted unit in regards that they, could, they, they will do anything that the patrol officers in the street cannot do. So they'll go from one assignment to going through a door in a high-risk warrant situation with the machine guns, the battering rams, the ballistic shields, and the helmets to the very next job of maybe taking a cat out of a tree. Mm -hmm. So it's a very diversified unit, so that's why it's called service as opposed to SWAT, emergency service. Um, the emergency service unit um, is a 24-hour unit, and there's a saying in New York City uh, within the police department, when a citizen needs help, they call the police. But when the police need assistance, they call the emergency service unit. So they can do every, everything that they probably cannot do based on training, equipment, and things like that. They're on patrol. So unlike SWAT, which is, uh, unless they are um, patrol officers who are designated as SWAT members, you see that a lot across the sure. country as well, and they respond to a scene. But this is a dedicated unit, and they are on patrol just doing that type of work. So they can be at any scene, any location throughout the city within three to five minutes. So they're right on the spot when needed. That's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> so you get with ESU. What's next? So uh, I get into emergency service. Uh, interesting, when I first, the first day of training was the day of the Challenger crash, if you remember that. I do. So we spent the first day of training watching the events unfolding on, on television. I was horrified by that. And then we began our official training. When I went through it, it was only a, um, I think, a six-week curriculum. And then the other training that you would have to take, you'd do after, after you're already out in the field, you'd be pulled out for a week, you know, the EMT training emergency uh, medical technician training, everybody in emergency services are uh, EMTs. The scuba training, uh, you would take, be taken out. So now, uh, in current day, it's all done at one time while they have you. And the school goes almost seven months. Yeah. So you're going to school for almost seven months. And you're getting paid for it, so it's, it's okay. But um, it's very intensive. Uh, it's a very intensive uh, training curriculum that they must go through. So I went through it. I was assigned uh, first to um, uh, a truck up in Harlem, which is upper Manhattan, way up in Manhattan. I live in lower Brooklyn. So uh, I did that, uh, and I was you know, traveling. It was taking me almost two hours each way to get to work. You know, it was rush hour and you know, all of that. So uh, after about three months, they had a, another class come in. And then uh, once they graduated, we were able to move around a little bit, you know, let the, the rookies now, you know, even yeah. though I was still a rookie in emergency service. So I was able to get back to Brooklyn. I worked in uh, uh, Truck 8, which is North Brooklyn. And we covered uh, 13 different precincts within that area. And I did that for about five years. And I took a <clears throat> promotional exam for sergeant. <clears throat> and ultimately, I got called for that. I passed and got called for that. And I had to leave emergency service. And I went back to the same precinct I was as a police officer. Mm. 72nd that, Precinct. What was that like going back as a sergeant? <laughs> it was interesting, uh, and it was, uh, it was really no accident. I looked to do that behind the scenes a little bit, and I was able to get that done, to go back there, because I, I really enjoyed working in that precinct. Um, the people were somewhat distrustful of the police. However, once you gain their trust, then you were theirs. You know, they, they, they took possession of you. And I had that reputation as a police officer there. So I wanted to go back. 
Some of the challenges were that now you're working with some of the police officers that you work with now as a sergeant. So now you're the boss, you know. So I probably learned some of my best negotiation strategies, although I wasn't a negotiator yet at the time, uh, in that capacity, trying to negotiate some requests sometimes, you know, something that they would not ordinarily do. And I was probably guilty of some of it too, kind of bending the rules a little bit, not breaking them, but bending them a little bit. But now, uh, now I'm the boss, you know, so I had to uh, kind of just negotiate some of the things with, with my former colleagues as police officers. And I was there for about uh, almost, almost two years as a sergeant when I was invited back to emergency service now as a sergeant. So I went back to emergency service. And there I spent about nine years doing that. And I worked in also another Brooklyn truck, but on the southern side of Brooklyn, the South Brooklyn side, called Truck 6. And as I said, about nine years doing that type of work. And uh, then I took a lieutenant's exam, and I passed that. And I had then to go leave emergency service once again. And I went back to the 72nd precinct, <laughs> the very same precinct. Again, it was all by design, you know. That might not normally happen, but it was by design. And um, I didn't spend very long there, maybe um, just about a year, when I was invited then back to emergency service as a lieutenant. So I, I did uh, many different jobs within emergency service. I was a, uh, you know, uh, I did some patrol, patrol lieutenant, go from job to job to job, you know, throughout the city as a citywide supervisor. And then I was uh, the operations coordinator where I'd planned these big details. You know, um, at the time, President Clinton was the president. And he was here all the time in New York City. And it was always, of course, being the president of the United States, a uh, big security detail. And I would, I would organize that for the emergency service unit part of that. Snipers on rooftops and, and you know, different patrol units where the designated areas, and I would do that. And then finally, uh, my last assignment uh, in emergency service as a lieutenant was uh, the training lieutenant, where I'd be uh, responsible in overseeing the training, and that time it was now seven months uh, of the coordination of that and doing that. It was about that time when I was doing that, I, I did a patrol, um, a patrol day, a citywide supervisor, and uh, we're on a big barricaded situation. Barricade is uh, someone who's alone in their apartment, threatening to either kill themselves, you know, they might, there might be some mental health issues, committing suicide, or maybe they're an uh, individual that are wanted by the police and will not come out. <clears throat> I'm not going back to jail. I'll shoot it out with the police before I come out. So enter emergency service and the hostage negotiators. So it was on that job, and I, I happened to be talking on the door to the individual. The hostage negotiators had not gotten there yet. And I was developing a fair amount of rapport with the individual, and in fact even enabled him to put his weapons down and come out. But he was taken into custody. So the commander at the time of the hostage negotiation team, he saw all this, and he had seen me over the years, in fact, the commander of the hostage negotiation team used to be a, 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 a lieutenant in emergency service. And he was the one who interviewed me when I first applied for it as a police officer. So he knew me very well over the years. And we were on many, many assignments together. So after that assignment, after that job, after the individual came out, he approaches me and he says, Jack, listen, I'm looking to uh, retire very soon. And I'd like to leave the team in a good place. And I see over the years that you have bought into the, you have bought into the principles of negotiation. So the philosophy in policing has always been that just because you have the stick as a police officer, meaning the power, the authority, doesn't necessarily mean you have to use it. You may have to. Ultimately, law enforcement can be about the use of force, but you don't have to start at that highest continuum of force, which could be deadly physical force. You start at the lowest, which is communication, mere presence. And then if you have to escalate, you do that slowly. So you don't have to necessarily use it. So he said to me, uh, I see that you, bought into the, uh, you buy into the principles of negotiation uh, when you can. And I'd like to submit your name for consideration to take my place. So I said, well, I'm flattered and honored that you would even ask me. And thank you for that. But I wasn't sure. So I had to think about it. I asked him, can I get back to you in a few days? He goes, absolutely. So I thought about it, I talked to different people, you know, um, 
my wife, I talked to uh, other colleagues at, at work, and finally um, came to the conclusion, well, yeah, okay, you can submit my name. And if I didn't get it, that would be fine as well, because I loved what I was doing. I was a citywide supervisor, I was a training lieutenant. Um, I had a wonderful, charm career, I'm telling you. So um, the, the long and short of it was that uh, he did recommend my name. Uh, I was interviewed, and uh, I did get the position. So, which again, I mean, great progression yeah. through the agency, you know, out of everything that you've been able to do, what has been the best position that you've held within the agency, your favorite job, essentially? That's a difficult one uh, to answer because I have components of each and every one of the patrol. I love the patrol work because it was upfront and close and personal with the public, the community and you get to know them, they get to know you a little bit. I love that component of it. The emergency service work, oh my gosh, you're climbing bridges, you know, to try to rescue people and all the other amazing assignments that I got involved with. Um, and the hostage negotiation team. So I think if I had to favor one just a little bit, the preponderance of that would be maybe the hostage negotiation team because um, you look to resolve conflict with that before tactical force becomes necessary. And in fact, I think one of the greatest things that I did as a negotiator, and when I say I, I talk about the entire team, of course, was to keep members of the emergency service unit safe. Meaning, if we were successful in our negotiation strategy and enabled that individual to come out to us, well, that then meant that they did not have to go in to this hostile environment where we know very well in policing that every time you go through a door on a tactical application, there's a 50-50 chance at best of coming out safely. And nobody likes 50-50 right. odds. Emergency service unit didn't see it that way. They want to go in, they want to engage. Of course. They must. But uh, my way of thinking about it, you have a family, you have to go home to your family tonight. And I'm going to do my best to not to let you go through that door. So perhaps that's why I would maybe favor that a little bit more. Very interesting. And, and I, I honestly, I'd never really thought about, you know, when you think about a special operations unit within law enforcement and what mission success is, you know, it's the apprehension of the suspect, it is all the guys going home safe, but you bring up a very, very interesting point that, you know, if there is an entry, there is a high probability somebody, yeah. officers or suspect, are going to get hurt. That's right. But if you accomplish your goal, nobody gets hurt. That's right. That resolution is the win. Yeah. And... It's, it, again, it's, it's very interesting. It's nothing I've ever thought about before, but I appreciate you kind of highlighting that for me. Yeah, yeah. So. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'd like to spend a, a few moments and talk about September 11, 2001. Okay. How did your day start? Well, on September 11, um, 2001, at this point, I had just received my assignment to the hostage negotiation team just five weeks before. So it was, it was the end of July that I be. I was transferred into the hostage negotiation team. So that particular morning, I was scheduled to do a 1 o'clock to 9 p.m. tour of duty. So in the morning, I was getting ready to go to the gym. And just before I left for the gym, my brother-in-law, who lived downstairs from me at the time, calls up the stairwell and says, Jack, put on the news. So I put on the news, uh, and of course, the first tower had already struck the first building. Um, as I'm watching, everybody probably in the world is thinking that it was an accident. A small plane hit the building. You know. And then as I'm watching, and everybody else saw at the same time, the second plane hit the, hit the building. And horrified. Now we know what it is, exactly for what it is. I call into police headquarters, which is where, where my office was in lower Manhattan. <clears throat> I couldn't get anybody on the phone. I tried different phone numbers. Couldn't get anybody on the phone. I learned later on that everybody was evacuated out of that building because they figured that might be the next target. Police headquarters just makes sense, right? Sure. You cut off the head, and then the body can't function anymore. So um, I changed my clothes. I had a, uh, an unmarked police vehicle that was assigned to me because of my assignment. I was getting calls 24 hours a day, you know, all my equipment in the car. So I start, you know, now making my way into Lower Manhattan. I get as far as the, uh, the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, which is the tunnel that links the borough of Brooklyn into Lower Manhattan. 
and just five blocks from the entry of or the exit of the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel on the Manhattan side is the World Trade Center. I get there and it had been closed. Smoke was billowing and debris was billowing out the Brooklyn side of the tunnel, like a funnel, it was billowing out. So I couldn't get through there. I divert and I start making my way, lights and sirens to the Brooklyn Bridge and that had been closed. Brooklyn Bridge also from Brooklyn to Lower Manhattan. And um, that had been closed too, to, uh, to traffic. But because of my, it was a police vehicle, the emergency vehicle, my identification, the highway patrol who was blocking it off allowed me access. I get about halfway over the bridge when I'm met with swarms of people, thousands of people walking from the Manhattan side to the Brooklyn side on the roadway. So I was instantly stopped. And I'm very slowly now trying to navigate my way through the waves of people to get to the other side. And as I'm about halfway on that bridge and, and making my way to the other side, I hear screaming on my radio, my police radio. And then I look to the left and I witness the second building collapsing. And I was horrified. I was physically frightened. Oh my God. So I continue making my way. Finally got to the other side, and then there was complete gridlock. People trying to escape Manhattan, lower Manhattan. And traffic lights were not being respected, and there was complete gridlock. And again, I was fighting my way, lights and sirens, to try to get through. <clears throat> and finally, it probably took me another 15 to 20 minutes to get close to the World Trade Center. Then I had to put my vehicle someplace. And I had to wind up parking about six or seven blocks away and then made my way back to the World Trade Center, where I got on, uh, the first thing I, I saw was uh, a bucket brigade where they had these five gallon paint buckets and just filling it with debris and passing it back and dumping it, trying to find any trapped victims. <clears throat> so I got on that, brig on, on that uh, brigade and started helping with that, not knowing what else to do. I was probably one of the few people that had, actually had a filter mask right from the beginning because they took it out of my car. I had it from when I was assigned to emergency service and I had a, my, constru my blue NYPD construction helmet with me as well. So I was probably one of the few people in that area that I saw that had a mask on. Nobody had masks. So that might be a saving grace, thank God, uh, so far. And I knock on some wood here. Yeah. That, um, that, you know, those cancers that have been affecting so many so far has not tapped me on the shoulder. Thank God for that. So um, as the day progressed, you know, um, that's what we were doing. So uh, by the end of that day, I, I received a phone call from the chief of patrol, a man by the name of Bill Moranch, who was the uh, former um, chief of the Special Operations Division, which is the parent command of emergency service. <clears throat> He's now the chief of patrol. <clears throat> and he called me and he says, Jack, we're looking to bring back all former ESU people into ESU now on a temporary assignment because of your background and your training in rescues and, and building collapses and things like that. Would you be willing to do that? And I said, Chief, there's nowhere else I need to be. And this is still day one? This is day one, the end of day one. Because, <clears throat> okay, I'm cutting the order now. You are now assigned back to emergency service on a temporary assignment. You'll still be the commander of the hostage team when you go back. And it wound up being almost three months later, uh, every, every day at the, at the site. And that's how it went. <clears throat> so the rescue mission went, um, you know, the, as, you, as your listeners would, would remember, probably the first week was the rescue mission. Although the last person pulled out alive was on uh, September the 12th, 2001. It was a uh, police sergeant from the Port Authority Police named John McCormick. By a couple of our emergency service here, heroes. Patty McGee, uh, Scott Strauss, just to name a couple of them. But there were many more involved with that operation. And then after that first week, it became a uh, recovery mission. Although not much was really recovered, you know. We had body parts, maybe. But that's it. Uh, no full human beings left intact. You know, not much. I remember on the second day, um, we had I had a t I was overseeing a team of emergency service officers now, 
as the lieutenant. <clears throat> and we saw, we come across a man's arm, the arm torn from its body, from, uh, from the shoulder blade down. And it was a rather muscular arm. So I saw thinking to myself, oh, I don't know who this guy was. He must have been uh, maybe a weightlifter or into physical fitness. And then I had to catch myself. It's just, I got to stop doing that. This is only the first day that we're here, or the second day of the event. And uh, we're on a mission now. So we're just going to have to look at it. Okay, we have an arm. Let's get the people from, who are assigned to the morgue unit to get here and, and, and retrieve it and hopefully find some DNA and, for the family members. What struck me most <clears throat> when I first arrived that day on September 11th was um, the massive pile of debris over West Street and all the surrounding area. But yet, with all that mass, massive debris field, there was not one thing that was discernible as, a, as an office. Not one desk, not one computer, not one file cabinet, no telephones, nothing. Everything was just pulverized and just there. So I remember thinking, if hardened furniture didn't have a chance to survive, what chance did a, did a person have? But that didn't, that didn't stop your mission. Never. You know, and that's, that's what I find truly fascinating because it was an unprecedented event. And now you're on the pile. And you still, everybody still had the mindset of rescue. Yeah. Tell me about, did the mood change when that rescue mission went to recovery? Although uh, it was officially designated as a rescue, um, as a recovery mission after that first week, I think uh, everybody had the same mindset. No, we're still looking. We're going to still, still be looking, you know. So um, I think maybe some might have been disappointed that they changed that designation. That was more for the family members. My family members still missing. They might still be alive. How can you not make it a rescue mission anymore? But I think for the, uh, the first responders, police, fire department, EMS, all those that were first there, um, that mindset remained the same. That it, well, yeah, okay, you're calling it a recovery, but we're still we're still looking for any any possible survivors. So how long were you down there in total? I was there almost almost three months. Um, every day, uh, on average, there were 12-hour tours of duty. But oftentimes, if something would be recovered, you'd find something. Then it would go on beyond that. So that was your routine. You'd go to. I was working uh, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So my routine was I would probably get home. <clears throat> Eight o'clock in the evening. Wash my have my clothes washed, you know, right away, and uh, jump in the shower, have a dinner, go to sleep for a few hours, and up again, and back. That was a routine for almost almost three months. So um, <clears throat> I remember one day uh, it was uh, probably around October. So now we're about a month into it, <clears throat> and we're on the pile as as we called it, and I'm with the you know team of officers, and we're just. Going through debris, looking, uh, we have the fiber optic cameras that were going down in the voids, trying to see if we see anything. If we had any uh, smell of human decay, we'd focus on that area. We'd get the canine dogs in there to see if they could you know, isolate the location. But this one particular day, it was a sunny day, and I remember <clears throat> looking down on the ground, and I see what appeared to be a little bit, a little white speck. So I go down closer, you know, examine it, and I see it's a tooth, a human tooth. Oh my gosh, a tooth. And I was so thrilled to see that tooth. So I had the unit uh, that was assigned to the morgue. They were you know, right down there on the site. They came, they bagged it, they marked its coordinates. And my hope was that if they were able to extract some DNA out of that tooth and maybe find who it belonged to, that family could have maybe some kind of closure. Bury it if they wished, you know, make a prayer service over it but something for them. You know, <clears throat> because so many people, um, love family members, loved ones, did not get anything back at all, uh, think about that for a second. Over 220 stories of office space collapsed. Each building was 110 stories each. I already described that uh, not much was found at all. And the fires 
from the jet fuel that we're burning, we're burning at 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Cremation takes place at about 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit. So what remains were left, most of that was cremated. And that's what we were walking on, cremated remains, you know, dust and pulverized cement and all, everything else that was there. So not much was recovered. So many family members did not get anything back. So the city's response to that was to um, get some soil from dirt from the site, put it in wooden urns, and give each family member that urn, if they wanted it, along with an American flag. So if they wished, they could make a little memorial in their homes. The last, per the last place where my loved one was alive. Maybe far stretched that maybe some of their cremated remains might even be in that, that urn. Conversely, a lot of people didn't want it because the cremated remains of the terrorists might also be in that urn. And I don't want that in my house, certainly. So it was a very personal choice uh, who, who would have that. But it was uh, for those that got nothing back and chose to accept that, they could make that little memorial in their homes for that family member. So being a professional law enforcement officer your entire career, I'm sure you've heard the, phrase, the saying or the phrase, you know, nobody would ever want another 9-11, but our country could probably use another 9-12, meaning there was never a clearer example of the unity of America than September 12th. I get it. And I understand you probably didn't have the opportunity to experience it the same way the rest of the world did because again, you're down there for three months. Mm. But give me your take on how the public put their arms around New York during that time. You know, it was amazing. So prior to uh, the attack on the World Trade Center, we were, having, we were having similar problems that we are seeing now throughout the United States with the anti-police sentiments. And starting on September 12th, and I get that, and I like that analogy, you'd be walking down the street, you'd be walking along the site, and people from the public was stopping and applauding. And it, we enjoyed that for a while. And then like, just as life happens, the pendulum always switches to the other side. And that's where we are, I think, right now. But maybe starting to come back a little bit because people are seeing about uh, the defund the police campaign and the anti-police sentiment, what it's doing, where crime is now going up. New York City was one of the safest cities in the United States deemed by the FBI, by crime statistics and all of that. Um, not the case anymore. So now, with the new campaigns going on, uh, now the politicians who are looking to be elected, mayor and other positions, are getting away from that. No, we have to refund the police because crime is going out of control now and the public is demanding that it change. So I think slowly the pendulum will start switching back to the other side, or at least somewhere in the middle, hopefully. We're talking about an event that occurred 20 years ago. And so we now have men and women, you know, walking the streets all over the U.S. who were not alive. It's true. When September 11th occurred. Yeah. If you had to give a message to one of those individuals and tell them about the men and women who responded that day, what would you tell them? Heroes all. Heroes all. They didn't know what they were walking into. Same with those first responders when the uh, two planes had hit the buildings and they hadn't collapsed yet. They went in there. They went in there. The New York City Fire Department lost 343 of their members. They had to do battlefield promotions because a lot of those were, were commanders and they had to promote people on the scene. The Port Authority police lost 37 of their officers, commanders as well. And the New York City Police Department lost 23 of its members. 
14 of those were my personal friends from the Mercy Service. Two of them I even interviewed to come into the unit when I was doing the training lieutenant position and recommended their assignment in emergency service to the commanding officer at the time. So I had a little baggage about, about that as well. Maybe I should have denied them, you know, they'd be alive. You know. sure. That was just, uh, you know, that was just about myself, I guess, you know. But heroes all, you know, and what they did. And they didn't think about anything else but making those rescues and trying to save people. That's what law enforcement does. That's what fire department does. That's what we do. So every year on September 11th, I would go to the memorial. Sometimes I'd meet up with a group, um, and I was still working for the first, uh, I retired in 2015, so for 14 years after that I was still working. So I'd go while I was working, and I'd meet up either with a group or sometimes just on my own, just to reflect. I had lost many friends uh, on that day. And then after I retired, I would still continue to go. In fact, just before I retired, uh, we did a training exercise before the, before the uh, memorial was actually opened up on the two pools, because we anticipated that we might see some people who were so distraught by going to that site they may look to jump into the pool and drown themselves, commit suicide. So we actually did uh, some negotiation training on the pools there. We used police officers as a, as a subject who was contemplating, and we tried to negotiate them. Emergency service was there. If they had to go and make a rescue, they practiced that. So um, we did that because the, the effects of this are going to be long-lasting for sure. So in the emergency service, we have what we call 10 emergency squads. And they're designated throughout the five boroughs. There's two in Manhattan, there's two uh, uh, in the Bronx, there's three in Queens, there's three in Brooklyn, and there's one in Staten Island. And um, Truck 1 is the uh, emergency service unit that covers lower Manhattan, and also in that territory, of course, or that jurisdiction is the World Trade Center. So they were uh, the first emergency service unit to respond on the scene. Again, thinking at first it was just an accident of a small, small aircraft and quickly learned very differently. And once uh, the word got out, uh, trucks, emergency service trucks from throughout, throughout the city all responded to the scene, as did the fire department and EMS and, and everybody else. And. Um, this is, uh, again, the first responders were the ones that rushed into the building. And that's how we lost so many folks, you know, so many heroes. So New York City uh, is, is very unique in that um, the police department, emergency service unit, mostly, the fire department, EMS, we all have to work in unison. And sometimes there are... Uh, overlapping roles that we play. For example, car accidents, uh, you know, a serious car accident where people might be trapped in their vehicle. Both the police department emergency service unit and the fire department are trained in vehicle extrication with the jaws of life. And um, how it would usually work, whoever might get there first, they would start the operation and then be assisted by the other unit. So if the police department got there first emergency service, they would start the operation by trying to extricate that individual and then the fighter department would come and did offer any support that they can. And then, of course, EMS is there to remove the individual safely out of that vehicle, put the collar on them and put them on the backboard and so on. So it's a um, unique experience uh, in working with that. And uh, in emergency service, you know, they, they, it's the same, usually the same response units in a designated area that would respond, fire department, police department, EMS. So you get to know them. After a while, you see them all the time and you get to know them. And uh, it just forces a more cooperative you know, uh, approach, response approach.